Chapter Nine of the Egoist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. Chapter Nine. Clara and Letitia meet. They are compared. An hour before the time for lessons next morning, young Crossjay was on the lawn with a big bunch of wild flowers. He left them at the hall door for Miss Middleton and vanished into bushes. These vulgar weeds were about to be dismissed to the dust heap by the great officials of the household. But as it happened that Miss Middleton had seen them from the window in Crossjay's hands, the discovery was made that they were indeed his presentation bouquet, and a footman received orders to place them before her. She was very pleased. The arrangement of the flowers bore witness to fairer fingers than the boy's own in the disposition of the rings of colour. Red campion and anemone, cowslip and speedwell, primroses and wood hyacinths, and rising out of the blue was a branch bearing thick white blossom, so thick and so pure a whiteness, that Miss Middleton, while praising Crossier for soliciting the aid of Miss Dale, was at loss to name the tree. "'It is a gardener's improvement of the vestal of the forest, the wild cherry,' said Dr. Middleton, "'and in this case we may admit the gardener's claim to be valid, though I believe that with his gift of double blossom he has improved away the fruit. Call this the vestal of civilization. Then he has at least done something to vindicate the beauty of the office, as well as the justness of the title. It is Vernon's holy tree that young rascal has been despoiling, said Sir Willoughby merrily. Miss Middleton was informed that this double blossom wild cherry tree was worshipped by Mr. Whitford. Sir Willoughby promised he would conduct her to it. You, he said to her, can bear the trial. Few complexions can. It is to most ladies a crueller test than snow. Miss Dale, for example, becomes old lace within a dozen yards of it. I should like to place her under the tree beside you. Dear me, though, but that is investing the Hamadriad with novel and terrible functions, exclaimed Dr. Middleton. Clara said, Miss Dale could drag me into a superior court to show me fading beside her in gifts more valuable than a complexion. She has a fine ability, said Vernon. All the world knew, so Clara knew of Miss Dale's romantic admiration of Sir Willoughby. She was curious to see Miss Dale and study the nature of a devotion that might be within reason imitable, for a man who could speak with such steely coldness of the poor lady he had fascinated. Well, perhaps it was good for the hearts of women to be beneath a frost, to be schooled, restrained, turned inward on their dreams. Yes, then his coldness was desirable. It encouraged an ideal of him. It suggested and seemed to propose to Clara's mind the divineness of separation instead of the deadly accuracy of an intimate perusal. She tried to look on him as Miss Dale might look, and while partly despising her for the dupery, she envied, and more than criticising him for the inhuman numbness of sentiment which offered up his worshipper to point a complimentary comparison. She was able to imagine a distance whence it would be possible to observe him uncritically, kindly, admiringly, as the moon a handsome mortal, for example. In the midst of her thoughts she surprised herself by saying, I certainly was difficult to instruct. I might see things clearer if I had a fine ability. I never remember to have been perfectly pleased with my immediate lesson. She stopped wondering whither her tongue was leading her, then added to save herself. And that may be why I feel for poor Crossjay. 
Mr. Whitford apparently did not think it remarkable that she should have been set off gambling of a fine ability, though the eulogistic phrase had been pronounced by him with an impressiveness to make his ear aware of an echo. Sir Willoughby dispersed her vapourish confusion. Exactly, he said. I have insisted with Vernon. I don't know how often that you must have the lad by his affections. He won't bear driving. It had no effect on me. Boys of spirit kick at it. I think I know boys, Clara. He found himself addressing eyes that regarded him as though he were a small speck, a pin's head in the circle of their remote contemplation. They were wide. They closed. She opened them to gaze elsewhere. He was very sensitive. Even then, when knowingly wounding him, or because of it, she was trying to climb back to that altitude of the thin division of neutral ground, from which we see a lover's faults and are above them, pure surveyors. She climbed unsuccessfully, it is true, soon despairing, and using the effort as a pretext to fall back lower. Dr. Middleton withdrew Sir Willoughby's attention from the imperceptible annoyance. No, sir, no, the birch, the birch, boys of spirit commonly turn into solid men, and the solider the men, the more surely do they vote for Busby. For me, I pray, he may be immortal in Great Britain. Sea air, nor mountain air, is half so bracing. I venture to say that the power to take a licking is better worth having than the power to administer one. Horse him and birch him if Crossjay runs from his box. It is your opinion, sir? His host bowed to him affably, shocked on behalf of the ladies. So positively so, sir, that I will undertake without knowledge of their antecedents to lay my finger on the men in public life who have not had early busby. They are ill-balanced men. Their seat of reason is not a concrete. They won't take rough and smooth as they come. They make bad blood, can't forgive, sniff right and left for approbation, and are excited to anger if an east wind does not flatter them. Why, sir, when they have grown to be seniors, you find these men mixed up with the nonsense of their youth. You see, they are unthrashed. We English beat the world because we take a licking well. I hold it for a surety of a proper sweetness of blood. The smile of Sir Willoughby waxed ever softer, as the shakes of his head increased in contradictoriness. And yet, said he, with the air of conceding a little after having answered the reverend doctor and convicted him of error. Jack requires it to keep him in order. On board ship your argument may apply. Not, I suspect, among gentlemen. No. Good night to you, gentlemen, said Dr. Middleton. Clara heard Miss Eleanor and Miss Isabel interchange remarks. Willabob would not have suffered it. It would entirely have altered him. She sighed and put a tooth on her underlip. The gift of humorous fancy is in women fenced round with forbidding placards. They have to choke it if they perceive a piece of humor. For instance, the young Willoughby grasped by his master, and his horrified relatives rigid at the sight of preparations for the seed of sacrilege. They have to blindfold the mind's eye. They are society's hard-drilled soldiery, Prussians that must both march and think in step. It is for the advantage of the civilized world, if you like, since men have decreed it, or matrons have so read the decree. But here and there a younger woman, haply an uncorrected insurgent of the sex matured here and there, feels that her lot was cast with her head in a narrower pit than her limbs. Clara speculated as to whether Miss Dale might be, perchance, a person of a certain liberty of mind. She asked for some little, only some little, free play of mind in a house that seemed to wear, 
as it were, a cap of iron. So Willoughby not merely ruled, he throned, he inspired, and how? She had noticed an irascible sensitiveness in him alert against a shadow of disagreement, and as he was kind when perfectly appeased, the sop was offered by him for submission. She noticed that even Mr. Whitford forbore to alarm the sentiment of authority in his cousin. If he did not breathe Sir Willoughby, like the ladies Eleanor and Isabel, he would either acquiesce in a syllable or be silent. He never strongly dissented. The habit of the house with its iron cap was on him, as it was on the servants, and would be, oh, shudders of the shipwreck that see their end drowning, on the wife. "'When do I meet Miss Dale?' she inquired. "'This very evening at dinner,' replied Sir Willoughby. Then, thought she, there is that to look forward to. She indulged her morbid fit and shut up her senses that she might live in the anticipation of meeting Miss Dale. And long before the approach of the hour, her hope of encountering any other than another dull adherent of Sir Willoughby had fled. So she was languid for two of the three minutes when she sat alone with Letitia in the drawing-room before the rest had assembled. "'It is Miss Middleton,' Letitia said, advancing to her. "'My jealousy tells me, for you have won my boy Crossjay's heart, and done more to bring him to obedience in a few minutes than we have been able to do in months.' "'His wild flowers were so welcome to me,' said Clara. "'He was very modest over them.' and I mention it because boys of his age usually thrust their gifts in our faces fresh as they pluck them, and you were to be treated quite differently. We saw his good fairy's hand. She resigns her office, but I pray you not to love him too well in return, for he ought to be away reading with one of those men who get boys through their examinations. He is, we all think, a born sailor, and his place is in the navy. But, Miss Dale, I love him so well that I shall consult his interests and not my own selfishness. And if I have influence, he will not be a week with you longer. It should have been spoke of to-day. I must have been in some dream. I thought of it, I know. I will not forget to do what may be in my power. Clara's heart sank at the renewed engagement, and plighting of herself involved in her asking a favour, urging any sort of petition. The cause was good. Besides, she was plighted already. "'Sir Willoughby is really fond of the boy,' she said. "'He is fond of exciting fondness in the boy,' said Miss Dale. "'He has not dealt much with children. I am sure he likes Crossjay.' He could not otherwise be so forbearing. It is wonderful what he endures and laughs at. Sir Willoughby entered. The presence of Miss Dale illuminated him as the burning taper lights up a consecrated plate. Deeply respecting her for her constancy, esteeming her for a model of taste, he was never in her society without that happy consciousness of shining which calls forth the treasures of the man. And these it is no exaggeration to term unbounded, when all that comes from him is taken for gold. The effect of the evening on Clara was to render her distrustful of her later antagonism. She had unknowingly passed into the spirit of Miss Dale, Sir Willoughby aiding, for she could sympathize with the view of his constant admirer on seeing him so cordially and smoothly gay, as one may say, domestically witty, the most agreeable form of wit. Mrs. Mountstuart Jenkinson discerned that he had a leg of physical perfection. Miss Dale distinguished it in him in the vital essence, and before either of these ladies he was not simply a radiant, he was a productive creature. So true it is that praise is our fructifying sun. He had even a touch of the romantic air which Clara remembered as her first impression of the favourite of the county, and strange she found it to observe this resuscitated idea 
confronting her experience what if she had been captious inconsiderate oh blissful revival of the sense of peace the happiness of pain departing was all that she looked for and her conception of liberty was to learn to love her chains provided that he would spare her the caress in this mood she sternly condemned constantia we must try to do good we must not be thinking of ourselves we must make the best of our path in life she revolved these infantile precepts with humble earnestness and not to be tardy in her striving to do good with a remote but pleasurably glimpse of mr whitford hearing of it she took the opportunity to speak to sir willoughby on the subject of young crossjay at a moment when alighting from horseback he had shown himself to advantage among a gallant cantering company he showed to great advantage on horseback among men being invariably the best mounted and he had a cavalry style possibly cultivated but effective on foot his raised head and half-dropped eyelids too palpably assumed superiority willoughby i want to speak she said and shrank as she spoke lest he would immediately grant everything in the mood of courtship and invade her respite i want to speak of that dear boy crossjay you are fond of him he is rather an idle boy here and wasting time now you are here and when you are here for good my love for good he fluttered away in loveliness forgetful of crossjay whom he presently took up the boy recognizes his most sovereign lady and will do your bidding though you should order him to learn his lessons who would not obey your beauty alone commands but what is there beyond a grace a you divine that sets you not so much above as apart severed from the world clara produced an active smile in duty and pursued if crossjay were sent at once to some house where men prepare boys to pass for the navy he would have his chance and the navy is distinctly his profession his father is a brave man and he inherits bravery and he has a passion for a sailor's life only he must be able to pass his examination and he has not much time sir willoughby gave a slight laugh in sad amusement my dear clara you adore the world and i suppose you have to learn that there is not a question in this wrangling world about which we have not disputes and contests ad nauseum i have my notions concerning crossjay vernon has his i should wish to make a gentleman of him vernon marks him for a sailor but vernon is the lad's protector i am not vernon took him from his father to instruct him and he has a right to say what shall be done with him i do not interfere only i can't prevent the lad from liking me old vernon seems to feel it i assure you i hold entirely aloof if i am asked in spite of my disapproval of vernon's plans for the boy to subscribe to his departure i can but shrug because as you see i have never opposed old vernon pays for him he is the master he decides and if crossjay is blown from the masthead in a gale the blame does not fall on me these my dear are matters of reason i would not venture to intrude on them said clara if i had not suspected that money yes cried willoughby and it is a part and let old vernon surrender the boy to me i will immediately relieve him of the burden on his purse can i do that my dear for the furtherance of a scheme i condemn the point is thus latterly i have invited captain patterne to visit me just previous to his departure for the african coast where government dispatches marines when there is no other way of killing them i sent him a special invitation he thanked me and curtly declined the man i may almost say is my pensioner well he calls himself a patern he is undoubtedly a man of courage 
he has elements of our blood and the name i think i am to be approved for desiring to make a better gentleman of the son than i behold in the father and seeing that life from an early age on board ship has anything but made a gentleman of the father i hold that i am right in shaping another course for the son naval officers clara suggested some said willoughby but they must be men of birth coming out of homes of good breeding strip them of the hallow of the title of naval officers and i fear you would not often say gentlemen when they step into a drawing-room i went so far as to fancy i had some claim to make young crossjay something different it can be done the pattern comes out in his behaviour to you my love it can be done but if i take him i claim undisputed sway over him i cannot make a gentleman of the fellow if i am to compete with this person and that in fine he must look up to me he must have one model would you then provide for him subsequently according to his behaviour would not that be precarious for him more so than the profession you appear inclined to choose for him but there he would be under clear regulations with me he would have to respond to affection would you secure him a settled income for an idle gentleman is bad enough a penniless gentleman he has only to please me my dear and he will be launched and protected but if he does not succeed in pleasing you is it so difficult oh clara fretted you see my love i answer you said sir willoughby he resumed but let old vernon have his trial with the lad he has his own ideas let him carry them out i shall watch the experiment clara was for abandoning her task in sheer faintness is not the question one of money she said shyly knowing mr whitford to be poor old vernon chooses to spend his money that way replied sir willoughby if it saves him from breaking his shins and risking his neck on his alps we may consider it well employed yes clara's voice occupied a pause she seized her languor as it were a curling snake and cast it off but i understand that mr whitford wants your assistance is he not not rich when he leaves the hall to try his fortune in literature in london he may not be so well able to support crossjay and obtain the instruction necessary for the boy and it would be generous to help him leaves the hall exclaimed willoughby i have not heard a word of it he made a bad start at the beginning and i should have thought that would have tamed him had to throw over his fellowship uh -huh. then he received a small legacy some time back and wanted to be off to push his luck in literature rank gambling as i told him londonizing can do him no good i thought that nonsense of his was over years ago what is it he has from me about a hundred and fifty a year and it might be doubled for the asking and all the books he requires and these writers and scholars no sooner think of a book than they must have it and do not suppose me to complain i am a man who will not have a single shilling expended by those who serve immediately about my person i confess to exacting that kind of dependency feudalism is not an objectionable thing if you can be sure of the lord you know clara and you should know me in my weakness too i do not claim servitude i stipulate for affection i claim to be surrounded by persons loving me and with one dearest so that we two can shut out the world we live what is the dream of others nothing imaginable can be sweeter it is a veritable heaven on earth to be the possessor of the whole of you your thoughts hopes all sir willoughby intensified his imagination to conceive more he could not or could not express it and pursued but what is this talk of vernon's leaving me he cannot leave he has barely a hundred a year of his own you see i consider him i do not speak of the ingratitude of the wish to leave 
You know, my dear, I have a deadly abhorrence of partings and such like. As far as I can, I surround myself with healthy people, especially to guard myself from having my feelings wrung. And excepting Miss Dale, whom you like, my darling does like her? The answer satisfied him. With that one exception, I am not aware of a case that threatens or torment me. And here is a man under no compulsion, talking of leaving the hall. In the name of goodness, why, but why? Am I to imagine that the sight of perfect felicity distresses him? We are told that the world is desperately wicked. I do not like to think it of my friends, yet otherwise their conduct is often hard to account for. If it were true, you would not punish Crossjay? Clara feebly interposed. I should certainly take Crossjay and make a man of him after my own model, my dear. But who spoke to you of this? Mr. Whitford himself. And let me give you my opinion, Willoughby, that he will take Crossjay with him, rather than leave him, if there is a fear of the boy's missing his chance of the navy. Marines appear to be in the ascendant, said Sir Willoughby astonished at the locution and pleading in the interests of a son of one then crossjay he must take i cannot accept half the boy i am he laughed the legitimate claimant in the application for judgment before the wise king besides the boy has a dose of my blood in him he has none of vernon's not one drop ah you see my love oh i do see yes i put forth no pretensions to perfection sir willoughby continued i can bear a considerable amount of provocation still i can be offended and i am unforgiving when i have been offended speak to vernon if a natural occasion should spring up i shall of course have to speak to him you may, Clara, have observed a man who passed me on the road as we were cantering home, without a hint of a touch to his hat. That man is a tenant of mine, farming six hundred acres, Hopner by name, a man bound to remember that I have, independently of my position, obliged him frequently. His lease of my ground has five years to run. I must say I detest the churlishness of our country population, and where it comes across me I chastise it. Vernon is a different matter. He will only require to be spoken to. One would fancy the old fellow laboured now and then under a magnetic attraction to beggary. My love, he bent to her and checked their pacing up and down. You are tired? I am very tired today, said Clara. His arm was offered. She laid two fingers on it, and they dropped when he attempted to press them to his rib. He did not insist. To walk beside her was to share in the stateliness of her walking. He placed himself at a corner of the doorway for her to pass him into the house, and doted on her cheek, her ear, and the softly dusky nape of her neck, where this way and that the little lighter-coloured irreclaimable curls running through and from the comb and the knot curls half curls root curls vine ringlets wedding rings fledgling feathers tufts of down blown wisps waved or fell waved over or up or involutedly or strayed loose and downward in the form of small silken paws hardly any of them much thicker than a crayon shading cunninger than long round locks of gold to trick the heart letitia had nothing to show resembling such beauty end of chapter nine read by lars rolander